What's happening guys? Welcome to It's All Black Academic with me, your host, Jordan Jarrett Bryan. Now, over the last 12 months or so, many of my friends who are parents have been discussing just one, one main thing. It's homeschooling their children. And they've talk, talked to me and told me, sometimes bored me because I don't have kids, about how difficult it has been for them teaching their kids at school and transitioning from um, taking their kids to school to actually now day to day trying to make sure their kids are educated at the home and they found it very 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 difficult and very very challenging and I, I've got some friends that I know for a fact on the day that kids could go back to school they were literally kicking their kids out of the car through the gates to get back into the school and couldn't wait because it was so hard for them and they couldn't wait to get their kids back into that routine but some of my other friends who have kids have also spoken about the fact that they did find it hard and challenging but they think they're going to, going forward, continue with the idea of teaching their kids at school. So I wanted to have a discussion today around homeschooling. And we have a lot of this discussion within the black community in particular about how sections of our curriculum in this country maybe don't serve uh, black kids and how many are failing. The idea that the way going forward is only to homeschool now. And I want to speak to my panelists today about that very question. Is homeschooling the only and the best way forward for in particular black kids? You might disagree, you might think it's something you're trying to experiment with as well. And to do so, I've got three fantastic guests on my show this week. I've got first of all, Catherine Beerback seeing here, who's a former head teacher and founder of Michaela Community School, a free school established in 2014. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. I'm also joined by Anne Palmer, who's an education leader and the chief executive of Fig Tree International, an organisation that provides advice and support to schools both here in the UK as well as abroad. Thank you for joining me here too as well. And my final guest, the returning guest, we have Jamelia, former singer-songwriter, now presenter, and more importantly for today, the mother of four children, all of whom I believe were homeschooled. How are you doing, Jamelia? I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me again. Thanks for joining us. So Jamila's joining us from Birmingham. And ladies, thank you so much for coming on uh, the show today. I think it's a really important and interesting discussion I think needs to be had about the merits of homeschooling. Let me just kick off by throwing a stat at everyone, which is the number of children who are home educated in England has gone up almost 13% in the year prior to the lockdown. I'm going to start off by asking you, Anne, why? Um, I think the context is, is that everybody now, to some extent, has had an experience of homeschooling. It's been thrown onto people um, in a way that they weren't expecting. Mm. And I suppose, to some extent, that it's had an impact both on adults and the children. Um, we, as parents and educationalists, come at this at different angles. Parents will clearly always want the best for their children. Um, and maybe uh, venturing into that world, that virtual world of having the teacher in your living room every day of the week, perhaps to some extent uh, uh, people may feel that it's an easier thing to try, but I don't necessarily see that as being the way forward. Okay, well, we're going to get to in a bit, a bit later on yeah. whether you, you two in particular are for or against it. But Catherine, what are, what are the reasons that you're seeing as to why there's been a rise in the amount of parents now that are deciding to homeschool their kids? Well, it's a really interesting statistic. I sadly think that it might be because uh, during the pandemic, of course, parents were able in a way to be in their children's classrooms. So normally you don't really have any idea what's going on um, in, in your child's classroom because you send them off to school in the morning, have a nice day, they come back, how was your day? Fine. And, and, and you, don't, you don't really know. With Zoom lessons that might have taken place, um, you were then hearing what was being taught. And, um, and perhaps you saw some disruption, you saw some of the stuff that uh, I think can be problematic in the education system. And as a parent, um, I can imagine that people might have thought, oh, well, if I have the option, because not everybody has the option mm -hmm. to homeschool, because mm -hmm. it's, it's an expensive thing to do, really. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but if people have that option, they might have thought now, gosh, I, I didn't realize that actually the school wasn't able to provide what I thought it was providing. Perhaps I'll just do it myself. Um, in, with schools that weren't doing Zoom lessons, perhaps the 
lack of quality work that was being set. I can imagine that might have spurred some parents mm -hmm. to think, maybe I should do this. Um, also, simply doing it. Sometimes I think parents can be really intimidated by homeschooling and they think to themselves, I'm just not capable of it. And perhaps trying it out for a while, there are those parents who are pushing their children through the school gates and saying, go, go. But then there are others, possibly, I think, who might have thought, actually, I'm not so bad at this mm -hmm. and I can do this better than the school. Um, and maybe they decided to do it for those reasons. I mean, I'm guessing, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jamila, so you've been homeschooling now for many, many, many years. Um, am I right in saying that you have, you've never sent your kids to school or were they initially at school and you took them out? And if so, why? Okay, so my children have been uh, in and out of school throughout their, their lives. Um, so I've been homeschooling now for 20 years. And I say 20 years because even though my eldest daughter is 20, I believe that the homeschooling journey starts at birth. Um, and um, so... It was really interesting over lockdown in particular. Um, my bonus son, who is my husband's son, um, he actually lives with his mom um, and does go to school full time. Um, but during lockdown, um, he spent an extensive amount of time with, um, with us. And as Catherine said, we got to actually see what was going on essentially in the classroom. Um, and for me, what I saw only reinforced my decision on why we should homeschool our children. Um, so my, I have a 20 year old, a 15 year old, my bonus son is 11, and then my youngest daughter is three. Um, I have no intention of sending my three year old to school. Um, my 15 year old, she went to school, she started school at seven and she left at 11. Um, and then recently she's just gone back because she wants to have her GCSE qualifications, um, something that um, whilst I was apprehensive about, I do support. And I think it's important that, especially at the age that she is, she's turning 16 this year, she wants to have her uh, um, certificates on paper, I guess. Um, and so I do support um, her decision. Um, as I said, my three-year-old, I have no intention of sending her to school, but I also am open to her wanting to go at some stage and I will give her the opportunity. But again, I, I, I know what it's going to be. You know, I've had so many negative experiences when my children have been in school that they have ended up making the de decision to come back out again. Um, but um, yeah, so I'm a huge advocate for homeschooling. And, um, you know, whilst it's quite, it sounds quite complicated, I think the reason that people have been... Um, you know, the, the increase in wanting to homeschool, I do think it's because they've had a goal. I think we have to remember that we've been indoctrinated to think that, you know, this is how it goes. You put your child into nursery, then they, you know, what, what school place are they going to? Um, and then it's what secondary school. And it's just, we just think that's the only way. But lockdown has given everyone an opportunity to not only see the inadequate uh, schoolwork that our children are receiving or education, should I say, but also we've had an opportunity to actually do it ourselves and realize we are capable of doing that and we are capable of sometimes delivering a, um, a, a superior version of education to our children. Um, sorry, that was a very long way. No, 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 that's, <laughs> no, no that, that's, that's, that's really insightful. Um, uh, Catherine and Anne, talk me through, and I'll come back to you in a second, the downsides of homeschooling, because this idea that something I was speaking to a head teacher friend of mine yesterday, and this idea that parents think I can teach my child better than a teacher, um, she felt was quite dangerous. But what are the downsides, do you think, to, to homeschooling? I mean, if I, if I may, um, I think that um, we have to very clearly think, are we uh, working the system from a parental angle or from the, 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 uh, the face of the child? Mm -hmm and in terms of the impact that um, not being able to socialise more widely with peers of the same age. The context that I particularly work in is one of equality and uh, my fundamental belief is you cannot change the system by opting out of the system. You have to become part of it and part of that change. So, um, you know, as Catherine said earlier, it's not every parent that's going to be able to afford to homeschool. Uh, we are all taxpayers. We are all entitled to a good standard of education for our children. And I believe that you can only get that if you are uh, part of the system and are speaking up for that change. 
In terms of um, the downsides, again, it's the socialisation, it's the mental health. We, we see the repercussions of students who have been at home for a period of time. Uh, the government is talking about changes in behaviour and all of those um, aspects. But I very firmly see it that you know, we, are, uh, we are training our children to be leaders of the future. If they have opted out of society, however long that may be, um, then that's difficult to push forward that agenda. Uh, it becomes more exclusive and elitist rather than being inclusive. And I'm very much around um, equality and inclusion. Um, I think the other things are wider aspects of school life, um, such as trips and visits, after school clubs, do, being parts of, uh, being taking parts in plays. Um, that was one of the, the, the strengths of my education, for instance. I'm performing arts background and all of those things that you associate with that, choirs and plays. I wouldn't have been able to engage with that had I been homeschooled. Um, so for me, it's important that the socialisation aspect, but again, looking at uh, what teachers have to offer. Uh, they have degrees in a variety of subjects. There's no way that a parent can replicate that knowledge. Uh, they could try, but sometimes you would revert to maybe textbooks, exercise books and so forth, sure. whereas uh, teachers have gone to do degrees, master's degrees and, and beyond. So I want to put that in a second to you, Catherine, about the idea of teachers, of parents thinking they can do a better job than teachers. But I want to just go back to Amelia very briefly just to ask, is it fair? Because when, all the people I spoke to about the downsides of this said, they all said unanimously that the social aspect of it. If your kids aren't mixing with other kids, the trips, they're, they're missing out massively on a key part of their, of their growing journey. Is that something that, that you agree with? And if, if so, how did, you, how did you get around that? Uh, honestly, um, oh, I don't know, I'm a little bit like, I feel as if sometimes a lot of people, you know, socialisation is always the first thing that people jump on as a downside homeschool children are some of the most socialized children because they get to socialize not only with their peers and they do but also with people of many different ages um homeschool children are incredible communicators because of that reason and not only that when it comes to things like trips and extracurricular activities drama clubs um i'm speaking specifically about my daughter now She's done all of those things. You know, there are there are plenty of homeschooling groups, massive groups. I'm a part of um, several uh, particularly black home educated uh, children groups, but also just home education in the UK groups. Um, there are plenty of opportunities. And I think um, what we need to not get mixed up about is that these children are just sat at home with their parents. You know, we're, as a homeschooling parent, you're making a commitment to your child's education. And not only that, I think when you do choose to homeschool, you are making a commitment to homeschooling in a superior way. So you want the education to be better than school. So the, my reason for not sending my child to school is because I believe that I can deliver something more enriching, something more tailored to my child and something more beneficial to my child. So it's, you know, the socialization aspect. I think it's, it's this assumption that we're just sat at home, but it just doesn't go like that. It's a commitment that homeschooling parents make and all of these things are thought of way before we even you know embark on the journey. Uh, and Catherine we did a show a few weeks ago about the, the hesitancy around the vaccine and I asked one of the doctors on the panel on that show about whether they felt that there's a disrespect towards medical professionals that the public know more than they do. If they advocate for taking the vaccine that's not just said on a whim they're saying it because they've done this work for, for many, many years. Similar question with, with, with teachers. As a former head teacher yourself, do you feel that parents that think they can do a better job in teaching their kids is slightly disrespectful? And I'm not being uh, provocative here, Jamelia. Slightly disrespectful no, 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 I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> to, 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 to teachers who think, well, I can teach my kids maths, English and science better than you can. I accept there's more subjects that they, they do teach at home. But do you feel there's a little bit of a, well, I've been doing this for 20, 30, 40 years. What makes you think you can raise those kids in an educational environment better than me? Well, it's odd because I know I, I'm a headmistress and I've been a te in teaching all my life and um, I, I very much believe in trying to make schools better, but I am find myself in this weird position right now where I want to say 
you know, Jamelia is brilliant. <laughs> I love the fact that she's homeschooling. I love it when I hear, um, you know, we should be homeschooling from birth. I mean, that is exactly right, okay? <laughs> and I just wish every parent could hear you. I wish you could be on billboards everywhere saying homeschooling from birth. <laughs> Because that is the point. From the moment they are born, you need to be teaching your children. You need to be showing them black and white cards. Then you need to move to colored cards. You need to be reading to them constantly from the moment that they're born. And then as soon as they can sit up, you're reading to them and moving your finger underneath the words. And then you're yeah. getting the, the board books and you're doing ball and house and bat and so on. And then you're doing a bit of phonics. You can get your children to know how to read before they start school. And what is so... Mm -hmm. Frustrating for me as a teacher is that because the state is always doing stuff for us, we presume, just like Jamelia said, we presume that the, the I hear it all the time from parents. Well, well, well you know, the, the, the state is going to teach my kid. The school is going to teach my kid how to read. I don't have to teach my kid how to read. The, the, the state will do it. And then I try and say, but what if the state does it really badly? What if the state doesn't know what it's doing? Mm -hmm. What if the school, because the thing is, there are 23,000 schools in the country and some of them are really, really good and some of them are really, really bad. And you got everything in between. And while, Anne, I don't disagree with the things that you were saying, the thing is, is that for, from a parental point of view, when you're saying, uh, the thing is you've got to be in it to change it and you know, it's about changing the whole system, I sort of feel that's my job, that's your job. You know, we're educationalists, and so we're gonna go, we, I've, my whole life is about changing the education system for the better. But for a parent like Jamelia, you know, you go to secondary school, you got five years. You know, why are you sending your child to secondary school to change a whole education system? No, you want your child to learn stuff and to be happy and, and to make friends and to grow and, and be kind and, and all of this stuff. And then in the end, you also want them to get some GCSEs. You want them to perhaps go off and do A-levels and, and have all the doors open to them possible so that they can do something with their lives, you know? So the thing is, is that the question it all rests on, is the school going to do this for you? Mm -hmm. And if you yeah. are able to yeah. go to a school where the school is doing that for you, <laughs> where you really feel your child is fulfilled, they're being taught well, um, they're, they're doing lots of homework, they're, they're doing what you want, right? And when I say what you want, what you imagine a school is meant to give your child, then brilliant, mm -hmm. send your child to school. If on the other hand, and as I said, most people don't necessarily have the option to homeschool, but when, when I say homeschool should be happening, and when Jamila says from birth, um, you know, the thing is, is that I know lots of parents, for instance, who might send their child to school, but when they come home, they're doing work with them all of the time. They're trying to support. They're not imagining that the school, they've gone to school, tick, that's all right. Too many parents. The child then finishes up with the, you know, the grade three, the fail in maths. And then they think, oh, I guess he wasn't that good at maths. And I think, no, it's because he wasn't taught maths properly. <laughs> and so, exactly. and, and, and the thing is, that could be the, the fault of the school, but it's always also the responsibility of the parent to make sure mm -hmm. they're being taught. And the thing about lockdown is perhaps some of these parents saw what was actually going on. Mm -hmm. And I'm not one of these teachers who's going to say that all schools are great. In fact, I'll say quite the opposite. <laughs> and, and so the thing is, the thing is, is that as a parent, I just want parents to take more of an interest. And, and, and I know, Anne, you were saying parents are always interested. I mean, of course they're interested. But when you want to really homeschool, you have to take serious interest. You've got to start finding mm -hmm. out. You're going online to find, well, how are we going to learn maths? And you might find the IXL website. I mean, I'm saying this for people who are listening who want to homeschool. Go and find IXL and find SmartTick and find um, Hegarty Maths and, you know, go on there and, and invest and then sit down with your child and do it with them. Well, I want, to, I, want, I want to put that question out there as well. For people that are watching this, talk, talk them through a day of homeschooling. What does homeschooling look like? Because okay. the, the idea that you wake up at eight o'clock, have your breakfast, then nine o'clock, you mm. have a math lesson, then it's, talk, talk us through, um, which you do, Jamila. Well, so Jamila, talk, talk yeah. us through <laughs> a day of homeschooling. For me, so for me, I my whole homeschooling ethos is based around the child and who the child is. So um, what, as um, Catherine said, one of the things I discovered about all of my children is that they're uh, what's called a kinesthetic learner, which means that they um, interact uh, with their learning or well, they learn best when they're able to interact physically with what they're learning so um our lessons are not necessarily all on you know paper so 
waking up in the morning. Um, so when my 15 year old, she's 15, she does, she does not want to get up at eight o'clock in the morning. And so um, we would start our homeschooling day at about 10 a.m. because that, that's what works best for her. Um, she, she works really well. Um, you know when she's when she's given um, her lessons in advance and um, also this is going to sound quite strange she didn't necessarily like being taught by me so i had to set work for her and then um, she's got a very um, solid routine at her age she was doing about five hours of work a day but um my three year well not my three year old but when she was a little bit younger i'd say when she was between the ages of like you know when she was like 11 she would do no more than three hours of work a day um because she's getting one-to-one teaching for that whole time um and and again even though when i say three hours a day of teaching i mean like formal teaching like we're going to do a lesson we're going to write this down we've got to put it in a book but for me again the whole day is dedicated to learning. You know, um, my my three year old. We we're not sitting down and with papers and pens. Sometimes we are, but what what learning to me looks like is you know maybe going for a walk and naming the flowers, counting the houses, spotting the numbers on the um, on everyone's doors. It's it's finding the opportunity, recognizing letters just anywhere, you know, um, in in the house or out and about. And I think for me, it's about making. Um, the educational environment all encompassing so at all times my children are going to learn we're going to have conversations where even if my children are probably watching something we'll speak about what they're watching so for me it's kind of like are you retaining this information are you learning anything is this good for you are you enjoying this um and for me the homeschooling journey is about that you know the um it, it's not necessarily about structure and and um and exam results for me the results are all the results you see them in your children you know my my three-year-old um she does attend nursery a couple of days a week and she's ahead of everyone at the nursery and some people might see that as a you know it goes against her but for me it's like yeah I'm, I'm, I'm doing the right thing and that's why I need to homeschool her because she is able to retain you know information and learn um, and it doesn't have to look like what it looks like at school so a homeschooling day for us doesn't look like a school day at school. Um, and it sounds pretty good to me I mean if, if more and more parents take up the option of what Jamila is doing mm. why is that problematic? You know, the, the bigger picture around education is that every child is somebody's child. And um, some people have more advantages than others and have more options than others as regards to what they do. Um, and I don't necessarily see that uh, it's the way that the system is. But if you are the kind of person that I am that believes that you actually work towards change, then you uh, work in partnership with whatever organisation is out there to support your child. So talk me through what, what, what changing from within looks like. The well, the, the thing is, as Catherine has said, not all quality of education is, um, is good or not. And you've, you've gone on to say that you believe that change takes place with, with the leaders, with the teachers within the school. But there's nothing more uh, positive and nothing more demanding than parental voice, than the, ch the, the voice of the child. We saw recently uh, a school that remains nameless uh, within a local authority where the children, uh, you know, were against something that took place and they took very stringent, stringent measures. I'm not saying that's the way forward, but, you know, we are looking for a society. We, we've operated where there are winners and losers. We, that's just gone on for far too long. Um, so you use your voice for change, you make people accountable. If there are things going on with individual teachers, then you, you speak with them and sort that out. The other thing that I would say about what Jamelia is saying is that one, one parent or two parents or whatever you have in your connection, more generally to home school, you cannot give the child the, the you know, for instance, in terms of equipment, you would presumably have to have three, four laptops. You know, with a teacher, they, they, they plan according to where the child is. They give them the individual time if they need that. Um, so there's that one-to-one -one aspect, even if you are teaching whole class, you know, that you can give that extra uh, time as necessary. Um, 
so you know i just i just feel the opting out is not what we need i'm seeing too many cases within education of um well firstly the positive aspects our schools are trying to change but they're looking for support and they're looking for support from parents like jamelia um to, to move forward with that change um and as uh, intelligent leaders education people and and parents we have got to support in order to make our systems better so is the issue here that the, the please can i can i go sorry yeah, can go, i go, interject go. here yes um okay so i think you know and while i understand what you're saying and i, com I completely get it i feel that what you're asking is for us to to gamble with our children and fight what uh, the education of our children should not be a fight it shouldn't be a struggle i shouldn't have to you know the amount of incidences i hear about on a daily basis that what i experience with my own children within the education system and what i'm talking about specifically is the experience of black children within the education system my children's head teacher did not look like you did not act like you and did not love them in the way that you probably would deal with a black child and i think for me i am not willing to gamble my child's educational experience uh, to you know for the bigger picture and i know that that sounds harsh but at the same time it's kind of like you know i'm not i'm not going to gamble with my child's mental health i'm not going to gamble with my child's self esteem i'm not going to um allow them to have this negative experience on behalf of the bigger picture for people in the future you know i i feel that it's um it's 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 counterproductive for our children i can't serve an education system that doesn't serve my children um and secondly because i feel like this was another thing that was implied that um you know because i might be well off that's why i can home educate it has nothing to do with money i have sacrificed my um my earning potential to be a home educator and it's something that a lot of home educators do um and i think we have to understand that the system goes far beyond the education system it also goes into you know the idea of of what work is and what success looks like and because people are chasing these you know highly material things it means that they feel unable to home educate their ch children because they're not financially well off you do not have to be well off we do not have several laptops up several laptops you know if if anything um my children i mean my children don't work on laptops they're discouraged from that because for me as i said they're kinesthetic learners and it's better for them to um to interact with their education in a more physical way so um this idea that you need to have loads of money or or loads of time or well, yes you do need loads of time but i think it's also about rethinking what is actually important what is actually a priority here and i think when it comes to black children we have to think about what we're asking of them when we're sending them to school they're not having the same experience as white children and um I'm sure we're going to go further into that but um I think it's something that needs to be um addressed when we're saying you know let's um I don't know I I feel as if we're saying essentially let's gamble with our children um to 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 help to serve the system I I just totally disagree with that So let me just get a response from you Andy do you feel it's unfair as Jamila says to ask parents to as she says gamble on their kids education for the better long term um, overall picture of education and, and the curriculum in this country. I don't think necessarily. I think that um, ed education is should be valued by everybody. Mm. And of course, as an individual parent or a grandparent or whatever, you are going to be putting your child first. And we see even with um, schooling. Uh, there are hybrid models and i think we will begin to see more of that in the future um the government has seen how schools work remotely and so forth but if you look at the drive that they were pushing forward is how soon can we get the children back into school and i think a cr an incredible amount of research now needs to be done about the long term impact of um what uh, has been the result of children staying at home and and this would obviously be the biggest a cohort or the biggest period the longest period of time that we've had in order to to which to base that research so i'm not necessarily saying every parent will put their child first mm. the other point just a minor point i'd like to make also is that you know we are at an advantage in that we are educated ourselves um but some parents can't read 
You know, I'm not saying we take on the responsibility of that, mm -hmm. but um, there is the aspect that there may be parents that would like to homeschool, but because of their own experiences of education and maybe perhaps difficulties, you know, such as dyslexia and so forth, that they themselves um, are not able to manage mm -hmm. to support their, their children. So, so yeah, so there's aspects of that 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 touch upon, not necessarily directly with uh, Jamelia's circumstances, but I think that as an educator, that would be something that I would want to look at also. So to, to, to that, yeah. if you're a parent that is in a position to be able to educate, but you really want to, what does that parent do? Yeah, well, and, 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 and Man makes some very good points there. I mean, I, I think what Jamelia w was saying and what I, I'm certainly saying is that if you want to homeschool mm. and feel you can homeschool, then perhaps don't be so scared of it. Um, when I was saying not everyone can afford to, I, I didn't mean to imply, Jamelia, that you weren't making sacrifices. And you made a really good point, which mm. is that people who uh, will homeschool you know, will have to make sacrifices. And perhaps people think they can't do it when actually if they made a few sacrifices here and there, they would be able mm. to do it. Um, mm -hmm. Now, if you can't, then you send them to school and you go yes. off and work. <laughs> but then when they come home, I cannot stress enough how important it is to be teaching your child at all times. I love when Jamila was saying the whole world, you know, you're counting the peas on the plate, you're going to football and you're, you're singing your times tables as you go. Every time, every opportunity that you can, you're using it as a learning moment. You cannot mm -hmm. just presume the school is doing a good job. Even if, look, if the school's doing a great job, brilliant. Then you're just giving them extra, aren't but, you? But, but just, <laughs> just to um, Anne's earlier point, then if we're paying taxes for teachers to teach our children, what is the point then? Their, their job, their, we're paying them to teach our children. Yes. If we know that our school is a failing school, it's not doing very well, the idea of sending them to, to school for five hours a day, whatever it is, and then coming home and almost undoing all of that by educating them at home, doesn't that, that doesn't make any sense to me then. Yeah, that is very true. And um, <laughs> the thing is, is that lots of people do that. <laughs> and, and, and if you just leave it up to the school, then the people who are making sure they're teaching the children and they're coming home, and then those children do better at their GCSEs, and then you look and think, well, why was that? It's because of a lot of the work that was going on at home. Now, clearly <coughs> there are some good schools, some mediocre schools, some not so good schools, you know? And you're obviously gonna try your best to get your child into the better schools. Mm. You, you do what you can. But don't forget what you can do at home, really, is the point. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, though, you, 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 you both made the point there that not everybody is able to do it, you know? And I suppose the point of view from the teacher, the teacher you mentioned who, um, uh, would think, well, who are you to go and, um, and think but you could think teach you your could kids better than me, when yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm somebody, a professional, I've got a degree, etc. Um, there is some truth to that. So sometimes parents can think they can do it and they don't really realize how difficult it is. And I think a lot of people found that out through the <laughs> pandemic year, yeah. because they didn't, you know, they're then trying to do it and they're thinking, oh my goodness, what on earth? I had no yeah. idea what those teachers were going through. The, the so. energy fell off very quickly after, yeah. after week two. All my <laughs> friends and kids were yes. like, yeah, I'm done with this now already. So <laughs> it, it is very hard. However, uh, you know, Jamelia talked about the various different homeschooling groups that exist. In America, homeschooling is massive and there are so yeah. many support groups. And then when you get involved in these support groups, there are other homeschoolers who you connect with and you're able to ha get help with. Sometimes there are little homeschool communities in America where yeah. they're sharing parents. So one dad is great at science, so he does the science mm -hmm. teaching and one mom is great at English or whatever. And you know, they're all kind of sharing each other around. Now look, I'm painting, because I can see Anne looking at me as if to say she's bonkers, and I kind of understand why. Is that what, um, is that what you're thinking? Ne never. <laughs> I mean, I get it, I get it, because I'm talking about the ideal situation, and that doesn't always happen. Sometimes mm -hmm. people decide to homeschool, and it's a total disaster. And just to give the other side, you know, the fact is, um, there's an organization called No More Marking. They looked at some uh, uh, year fives, uh, did you know, tens of thousands of, of essay writing with them when they were in year five, then looked at them again in year seven. Mm -hmm. And this is over the whole pandemic, so they've moved, you know. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they discovered that um, they essentially uh, realized that children had dropped back, and this was after the first lockdown, 22 months in their writing ability. So they'd wow. only been gone out of school for six months mm. and yet they dropped back 22 months. Now, I'm not saying that's happened to every child, this is on average, but we cannot discount the good that schools do. Mm -hmm. So as much as I agree schools need to get better, there are some schools that aren't very good and so on, 
Uh, they actually do contribute a lot to our national literacy rate, to our <laughs> national numeracy rate, and so on. Having said that, 20% of children leave school functionally enumerate and functionally illiterate. Yeah. And then you have to think, well, how is that possible? When I think we spend 90 billion, over 90 billion a year on education in this country, it's bizarre when you look at the PISA results, which is the international way of judging schools. Um, and you've got countries like Lithuania who are beating us, who spend a lot less money in education. From my point of view as an educationalist, I think, well, what on earth is going on here? Mm -hmm. Having said that, this pandemic, I was hypercritical of schools before, and I'm still critical of schools, but I have to say, what this pandemic taught me was that schools do a hell of a lot of good. Even the schools where I think they're not doing so much good, mm. they are, and we can often just not necessarily see that. So I wanna move in a minute onto the idea of um, particularly black boys and black Caribbean boys failing. A table came up recently about how they're the ones that seem to be doing the worst in schools in a second. But just before I go to that, I just want to put a question to all three of you. Is the issue here then, the curriculum is not serving our kids, or is it the implementation and execution of the curriculum that is the problem here? Most definitely um, both, I think. <laughs> because uh, the the government's view is very clear, the curriculum is fit for purpose, doesn't need changing, and any suggestion that it may do comes from a, a very negative standpoint. Um, one of the things that I do is I work with many schools in the country um, on a charter mark around, um, around race, mm. race equality, and part of the training that we do with them is about looking at uh, the curriculum and ensuring that um, as they plan for the children, as they plan for the young people, that their curriculum reflects the society that we live in. Um, and you can do that in a way that doesn't upset the norm. But what it does is it allows uh, professionals to see the curriculum from the viewpoint of the child and you know if you are going to do a curriculum that has only um, one type of person within it, um, how then is a child supposed to uh, improve their self-esteem, their self-confidence and know actually I'm valued here. So we do a lot of work with curriculum leaders around uh, their planning and making sure that they are hitting key levers around role models and where the history might come from and so forth mm -hmm. so that their children feel, look, that's, that's a person that looks like me. But sadly what happens is that um, uh, some schools are very set in their ways, unfortunately, and they are driven by the norm. So they don't do that reflective practice. And I'm very much in for reflecting all types of people, diversity particularly, uh, but other types of inclusion as well within the curriculum. Um, Jamila, similar question to you. Yeah. Um, when, when, mm -hmm. I was, when I was at school, I didn't do great at school. Um, and I look at something like history, for example, and the curriculum mm -hmm. for history was about the two H's mainly for me. It was the Henry and Hitler, and that was and a bit of slavery in between. That was pretty much it. <laughs> yeah. um, and to the curriculum, I tell myself the curriculum wasn't suited to me. I was also a bit lazy, mm -hmm. and there weren't a lot of black people. I was in a school in South London where there's lots of black people. There weren't many black teachers mm -hmm. that I could look at and yeah. relate to. Is that me just making an excuse for why I didn't do well? Or is, is, is the curriculum that we have in this country, as well as the lack of representation and imp implementation of it, a key reason mm -hmm. why a lot of black kids in particular um, don't do so well? And I accept that some black kids do do excel. It's, it's all very much broken mm -hmm. up. But what is the key reason for you? Is it curriculum or implementation? Um, again, um, just like Anne, I think it's both. Um, I think I think what we need to remember here is that um, whilst you know it's it's beautiful that some people are thinking about in, um, inclusion and diversity and um, and implementing it onto the curriculum, it's not actually happening because it's not mandatory. And so what that what that um, leads us back to is the you know the the government and the system and how everything is designed. Our whole education system has changed very minimally in the last hundred hundred years. A hundred years ago, black people were, you know, we, we, we weren't a part of society in the way that we are now. So we can't expect the curriculum to teach our children what our children uh, will benefit from. Um, they, um, as Anne said, the government have not acknowledged the um, disparities in the um, 
in the curriculum. They think it's fine. They think it's, you know, it's, it's great for everyone. Um, and I think what we need to remember um, is that the, the system is not, the system and the education system, the curriculum is not designed for our children. And just like um, Catherine mentioned, we we need to um, supplement our children's education for that reason. Um, so if you are sending your child to school, um, you have to provide a supplementary education. So uh, when our son goes to school, he'll come back and we'll talk to him about, you know, what he's done. And then we have to supplement that. He might learn something in history and we have to give him some additional information, whether it's, um, you know, on a black equivalent or, or, um, or, um, a, an explanation of what black people were doing around that time um, because he does deserve to have an education that's relevant to him in the same way his white counterparts have a, um, an education that's relevant to them. So, um, yeah, from my perspective, the curriculum needs to get bond down and uh, started again. <laughs> Do you agree, Catherine? Is, is it a case of scrapping it to make sure that, as Anne says, we are looking almost bespoke curriculums for different parts of the country where there are demographics of different types of people to make sure that those young people are getting the education that they need? Because what I need here in Brixton may be different to what someone in Sunderland, for example, may need. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, no, I don't agree. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, But let me explain. Um, First of all, it isn't the case that all black children are failing. You know, black Caribbean boys mm -hmm. aren't doing so well. Black African girls are doing quite well. So it, it, it isn't as, as, as obvious as, OK, black kids failing, white kids doing well. White working class boys, for instance, not doing well. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I don't think it's about what's in the curriculum. I think it's about the implementation of the curriculum and the implementation of values in schools. The, there's too much chaotic behavior, there's too much bullying, there's too much acceptance of low standards. That is what I think is problematic. Now, just to defend on the curriculum point, I think it's great the work that Anne is doing. I think it's brilliant and you know more power to her. Um, I think one of the reasons why we as black people sometimes think that the curriculum is the problem and we'll, as, as we have heard, uh, we, we sometimes think that the reason why a black child doesn't have high self-esteem is because uh, he or she hasn't been taught his or his history. The thing is, is that when you look at other uh, children who are failing, so the white working class boys, we wouldn't be able to say that about them. Why are they failing then? Because they presumably have been taught their history. Um, or when you look at communities that are really doing very well, say like uh, the Chinese community, well, they haven't been taught Chinese history, so why are they doing so well? What I would say is you've got to remove this idea. It may be that we ought to teach uh, more black stuff, but that it isn't connected to the idea of whether or not black children fail or succeed. The two aren't connected. And now then there's the question of should we be teaching more black stuff? And I say black stuff because I, I don't like this idea of black history and white history. I believe that British history belongs mm -hmm. to all of us, whether we are white yeah. or black. And I believe that all children, including black children, have a right to be taught that history. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's funny when you say Henry and Hitler, because they do, they do Hitler to death in schools. And it's ridiculous, <laughs> because, I, I mean, I just, it's ridiculous. They also, you have fine schools where they're doing the Titanic, and they're doing, um, they'll do the Titanic to death, or they'll do uh, Jack the Ripper to death. And the reason they do this is because there is this idea that in order to engage children, so you need to do, you know, gory and, you know, crime and mm -hmm. stuff that makes it kind of exciting, mm -hmm. you know, Henry, divorce, beheadings, you know, it's all kind of, and, and so, and the thing is, children are actually far more, uh, you can get a lot more out of them than, than, than we, we often uh, expect of them. That's what I said about low expectations. And mm -hmm. the thing that I think uh, the black community often doesn't see is that they, it's a, we think too much, um, this, because we're connected to this idea of curriculum and that it must be a race, racism thing and and, and I understand why. The reason why we think like that is because for years, black people were whitewashed out of history. For years, you know, they would teach in schools that, about the Second World War and they wouldn't mention the Indian, so, the, the, the million Indian soldiers who, who gave their lives or the hundreds of thousands yeah. of Caribbean soldiers who gave their lives. They, they, it, it, so black people were whitewashed out of history. Now, the question is, how much are they still whitewashed out of history? And Anne would be able to tell us much more about that than I can. And the reason why I can't is that I only have my own experiences in my, own, in my schools. 
And when the analysis is done, people will look at history GCSE and they'll say, well, look, this is what we're taught in history GCSE. But what we all need to realize is that only 40% of children actually take history GCSE. So most children don't take history at GCSE, which means that we never examine ch most children in this country on their knowledge of history. You never get examined on it. You go through your whole school career. Mm -hmm. What we really want to know is what are children being taught at primary school and at Key Stage 3 up to year 9. Now, the thing is we don't actually know. And if you look to the curriculum, the reason why government will say, but look, the curriculum's okay, is because there will be all sorts of options on there that can be taught. The question is whether or not they are being taught and how they're being taught. And the key thing is I need to stress the how. Because if uh, the, what we're being taught is not being implemented well, and there you need to look at behavior in the classroom, behavior in the school, whether or not the values of the school are all about lifting children up and giving them high expectations and expecting a lot of the kids, quizzing them to make sure they know the stuff, coming back to it, revisiting stuff constantly back and forth. If, if that isn't happening in terms of the teaching methods, and if, it's the, not, and if, and if the behavior is poor, and, and too often, mm. That is the case. Too mm. often in schools, behavior just isn't good enough. Okay? And you know, they say that my school is the strictest school in Britain. I mean, this is what they say. Um, because I'm, I'm a real... Is it, is it Catholic? Well, <laughs> I, I'm a real disciplinarian. Okay. And that doesn't mean that I march through the corridors with whips and, you know... I mean, obviously, in fact, I'm, I, I'm often meeting teachers in my office. But I have systems in the school. And I make sure that there is an expectation of behavior. Now, that is so key to a child's enjoyment of school and for him, to, his self-esteem. His self-esteem mm. comes from being able to learn loads. Mm. And if he knows mm. loads about Henry and knows loads about Hitler and everything in between and before Hitler and before, you know, going back to Roman times, if he is able to know the history of his country and be able to talk about it and have opinions about it, that is what builds a child's self-esteem. So, Yes, go on, go sorry, go. can go I on. respond to that? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, prior to being who I am, CEO of my, my, my company, I, I did four headships, both secondary and primary. And uh, the, the uh, research on curriculum being key is out there. So, you know, it, it's significant, it's important, because otherwise what we get are negative stereotypes, whitewashing out of the curriculum, um, uh, teachers with their own way of working where they choose what they want to choose and uh, miss out anything that's going to be important to any child of colour. Um, you get, uh, as I said, negative stereotypes. You get textbooks that don't mention black people, people of colour at all. So, and is it deliberate? Is this deliberate or just I don't, systemic? I, 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 I think it's systemic, definitely systemic. And you've, mm -hmm. you've got to... Um, it's that whole thing of what impacts. When you see uh, uh, young black boys in uh, planning up on the whiteboard, uh, what stereotype is being portrayed? What images are you looking at? What impact is that going to have? If you're only ever seeing uh, a black boy dealing with the police rather than mm -hmm. up there being a solicitor, uh, you know, a lawyer, a doctor or something like that, then that, you know, that impacts because every image, when, when they say we do, we do history, the only history is slavery. Mm -hmm. You know, it's pulling back to where uh, uh, people of colour don't want to be. So you have to mm -hmm. get into the middle and cause a little bit of confusion, as I call it. And the, 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 uh, the professionals that I work with actually really do listen and you know we could, there are some really significant videos out there that you can play them that show them that even from the age of three a child mm -hmm. is aware of 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 whether they are seen in a negative light by other people mm -hmm. from the age of yeah. three mm -hmm. so yeah. the curriculum is as as it is but you have to change the mindset we can't just say we can't just say oh it's about approaches to the curriculum. It's not about that. It's about there are it's historic and uh, systemic reasons why it is as it is. And through mm. training, through uh, CBT, CPD as we call it, um, it's for us to work with the profession in order to, mm. to make that change. It's got to be applicable also because, you know, there are things that, that um, what I always say about education is we, we or the system is built on 
what it was built 50 years ago. It's not built for the young people and how education is going to look in 40 years time, but that's a whole different discussion. I want to come anyway. to that a bit later yeah. on, actually, maybe revolutionising yeah. the whole system yeah. here in this country. But Jamelia, um, mm-hmm. more to kind of Catherine's point earlier on, um, mm-hmm. how much of a role do you think racism is playing in education in this country? And more importantly, how do we ensure that that section of, in particular, black Caribbean boys, how do we get them, mm-hmm. if they're going to stay in schools and the, those parents that maybe can't homeschool, how do we ensure that mm-hmm. those boys uh, do better? Uh, for me, I kind of feel that the, um, you know, it, first of all, I think that um, the whole experience of a Caribbean black boy, I have two younger brothers and I can acutely remember their experience being so different to mine. I loved school and I was loved by my teachers, but there were so many little things, especially looking back that I realized, you know, my brothers didn't stand a chance um, in the school environment and I think you know there um, there's a lot of uh, research to show that I think I think it's at the age of three uh, they adultify black boys in particular they do the same to black girls as well but um and that adultification means that they're not seen as little boys anymore and they, they are, they're actually seen as threats um they have um negative um there are negative ideas about them from from the age of three. So by the time they enter it, particularly into the secondary school system, um, it's, um, I, I don't know, I just kind of feel as if they are, uh, they, they enter with a deficit. Um, and because of that, the way that the teachers teach them, the way that the teachers interact with them, the way that they don't see themselves, all of these things are incredibly important. You know, the way that your, your teachers interact with you, um, and I feel that um, what we're what we're missing is the um, is the fact that is, is the experience. It's not okay. You know, I do agree that it may not just be down to the curriculum, but what about the curriculum that the teachers are getting? Um, I remember my um, my eldest daughter. She is twenty now. She went to do a. Um, she wanted to do sociology. She did one lesson, and the lesson was on uh, the disparity between, uh, you know, Caribbean boys and um, and I think it was Chinese girls, and they were talking about that. And she, I think she was seventeen or eighteen, and she was just saying to me, "Well, doesn't that reinforce that idea?" And this teacher was teaching it to me as fact. So sh- surely that's what they believe. And I think um, a lot of teachers who are teaching our young black boys have no actual experience of black boys. So they can't connect with them. They don't have things in common and and the things that they try to have in common, like mentioning Stormzy, um, doesn't, you know, it doesn't compute. And I think, um, so I think, I think it's societal. I think it's curriculum. I think it's the um, culture of teaching. I think it's the um, institution. And I think it's also a lack of effort on the um, education systems part of creating um, an environment, because I understand that schools are different, but creating an environment that serves the demographic that are in the school, if that makes sense. Yes, um, a couple of final, final questions I want to wrap with as well. The first one is, does anyone feel like we're missing a trick with, this, with the last year we've had and in terms of maybe revolutionising, you mentioned in your last answer, revolutionising how we educate all kids in this country. Is the model of how we educate kids in the UK in 2021 really conducive to the kids we now have in 2021? Or is, is, do we not need wholesale revolution? It's more about evolution. So when I, when, I, when I ask that question, I'm talking about, I don't know, just a radical one. Do we need to maybe have less hours in the day, but maybe a six teaching day? Do we need to maybe have two or three less hours a week on science and English, but more on economics and money management and sex education and things that maybe I would think are going I to think, benefit? Mm, Got sorry, sorry Jordan, I was just going to say, I think, I, I, you know, I, I, love, I love what you're saying there. I love everything about it. But at the same time, I think, you know, it's, it's very romantic. Like, it's a very romantic idea. I'm a, ran- I'm, I'm a, ro- I'm a romantic kind of guy, Jamelia. That's, that's the kind of person I am. You know? <laughs> But we have to remember that the system is set up to uh, essentially create people who are going to go into work and work for the system. And, you know, things like financial education, you know, economics, relationships, those things are not important to the to the system that they want our children to go in and work for. So um, so 
yes, it will be beautiful. For me, I kind of feel like we should have our own schools, particularly black people. Yes, it's not always about race, but for, for us to take control of the way that we educate our children, even just in the way that our children learn, our children learn in a different way, they communicate in a different way. Um, I've um, been in like a school that had predominantly black teachers. And I have to tell you, it was the most beautiful experience for me. And I just think, ah, oh, I wish I went to a school like that. And um, and and I, I you know, I, I understand that sometimes, you know, people are against kind of segregation and stuff like that. But for me, I kind of feel like, well, what are we going to do? I I would much rather not have to homeschool my children, but I feel that I homeschool my children in protection from this, this system because the system doesn't serve them. I would much rather send my children into a school that they are happy and they love and they are learning and they feel warmth and loved and, you know, and, and excited and engaged and that's my dream but I just you know again as Catherine mentioned earlier it might just be not in you know around or anywhere near where I live but um it's still a fact for me and still okay. why I homeschool but for me I kind of feel like yeah you know the, the as I said earlier the whole thing needs to get burned down and we need to build it again from scratch and um, to serve not only black children to serve all of our children because um that's how we change the world. We change the world through our children. But as I said, I just don't believe the system wants us to um, to have these well-rounded children. They want robots who know how to go to work, who know, who believe in the nine to five and who are going to send their children to school because okay. they want to go and do their nine to five. That's what I believe. Briefly, ladies, do you, do you agree that, that, that we need wholesale change in our education system here? Or is it a, a better case of just small tweaks? Well, I, I do believe that there needs there is ha change happening in education, actually, and I think that's great. I don't think the sort of thing that you're talking about is, is a bit that too, we up, too much out there. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, kind of short. I mean, but I actually think some of what you said is already in there. Okay. I think often we underestimate how much education has changed over the last, say, 50 okay. years, and sometimes not necessarily in, in the right way. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 being quite a traditionalist, want to pull back some of that, some of that change because I think some of the traditional ways of teaching actually don't do such a bad job. But you see, every community I, I will teach, you know, Greek people send their children to Greek school and Italians send mm. their children to Italian school and so on. You know, every community will want their children to learn their history and their culture and language and so on. You know, anyone who's listening who's wanting to homeschool, you know, David Olasuga's um, book, Black and British, it's blue, it's, it's quite short, it's written for children. It's a lovely book yeah. that you can read with your child. You learn lots of stuff there, that, you know, the British history, which involves black people, and it, mm. it's great. You know, we, the, it's the dependence on the state that I'm always trying to fight in the mindset of people, you know, black people, white people, everybody, you know, mm. uh, because where well, your child is everything. And from the moment that they're born, as Jamila, Jamelia said, you are in charge as their parent of their education. Use the state to help you where you can, but don't, don't farm out their education to the state in the okay. sense of just imagining they're going to do it. You take control yeah. of it and use the schools where you can in order to, 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 to benefit your child so that when they grow up, they're all the things you want them to be. Um, I think I know what you're going to say, but is, 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 it, is it wholesale change or is it right. as a bun down the whole thing and start again? Or I, I, love, I, I love that expression. I actually use it several times on my way home today. Um, I think there's so many disparities within education. And as an education activist, I think that we need to fight those disparities. Um, I think what's lacking is an overall vision for education in the country. The vision changes as you change government, you change vision and the priorities change. What we need are all the parties working together and saying that our children are more important than politics. So we are going to decide what our vision is going to be. And it doesn't matter which government is in place. We are going to push forward that vision. And it's got to be a vision that is suitable for our children in the future and not one based on how we were educated. The other thing I'd like to say is, and, and again, you touched on that, is that different communities are kind of doing their thing right now, you know, particularly Islamic yeah. schools and so mm -hmm. forth. And I think that's something to be explored. The reasons yeah. why they do what they do, the successes of those models. Um, looking forward, I think we as people of colour, as black people, need to, uh, you know, move towards um, establishing 
what education needs to look like for us, what we want it to look like, and, and, and move to getting that in place. Um, but I'll start, you know, I'll finish where I started in that I don't think total opt-out is the key, um, but I think what is coming anyway is a hybrid model of homeschooling and being in school. If we were to look forward far enough with all the digital changes that are coming into place, uh, you know, even offices now, offices are, are lying bare. People say, I can do, I've suddenly found out I can do everything I need to do without ever traveling. So if that's happened with adults, then we can't assume it's going to be different to, to children. But I think it's a process where you, whilst you're in, let's get some movement, let's shake things up a bit and get people talking about what needs changing. Uh, Anne, Catherine and Jamila, ladies, thank you so much for joining me this week on It's All Black Academic, a really interesting and I think important chat about the future of, of schooling and whether home, the merits and the downsides of homeschooling there as well. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel here on Black Academic here on YouTube. Follow us on across all of our platforms. We're on Instagram, we're on Twitter and we're also on Facebook. And join our membership on our website as well, blackademic.com. Till next time, peace. <laughs>